uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the breakout panel uh, number two. I hope you're in the right place. This is the panel on carbon sequestration for the evening. Um, just a quick uh, reminder to everyone that these sessions are being recorded and that we will be having a closed uh, question and answer portion at the end of this deeper dive. Um, just to let you know and to remind you that your feedback is very important to us and everyone here at Regen BC and the ministry will be sending out a detailed questionnaire uh, after the event to capture all your feedback. So why are we here? So the goal of the panel today is to broadly discuss the topic of carbon sequestration and the role it plays in technology and regenerative practices. I'm happy to introduce our first speaker, Alden Donnelly. She is the Senior Advisor, Carbon Markets at Terramara. Alden has almost 30 years experience in the design and development of greenhouse gas and renewable energy regulation, assisting companies with climate change risk, risk assessment and GHG related risk mitigation strategy development and execution. So over to you, Alden. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, first slide, please. Uh, a, li a little background. Um, uh, what I want you to do first um, is write down my email address because I'm likely to spawn way more questions than answers. I also thought that I'm, I, I'm quite intimidated by the uh, amazing uh, other two other panelists who are going to really focus on data and technology. So I thought that I would uh, try to um, maybe create a little context and then make some recommendations. Uh, based on my experience to date. Um, uh, the two bits of experience that I, I, I bring to the table um, that are probably important now is I'm a co-founder of a Seattle-based company, entirely privately financed blockchain-based new carbon market called Nori, the Nori Marketplace. And we've learned quite a lot in the development of that new and quite um, innovative uh, marketplace. Uh, that's what I've been doing recently. And 25 years ago, I was the co-founder and only president of something called the Greenhouse Emissions Management Consortium, which was a consortium of ultimately 14 of Canada's 20 largest emitters. And we formed a credit buyers group. And representing that consortium, I signed the first ever carbon credit purchase agreement with farmers in March, 1999. Uh, uh, so, there's sort of a lot of years in between those two bits of experience. Um, now, can we see the, the slide deck now? Um, I thought Glenn was gonna help with that. I might be going without slides, it looks like. <laughs> so we, we, can, we can see them. Oh, I can't see them. Oh, okay. Yeah. It so says legal, legal disclaimer. Okay, go, go to the next slide, please. Uh, I, I first wanted to provide um, uh, context and what you're going to see on the next three slide, slides are tables with uh, numbers in them that you probably can't read well on the screen. Uh, don't, don't worry about that. What I want you to know is that the numbers are there and encourage you to reach out to me or the RAN network and get copies of the slides and, and stare at the numbers till they start screaming some ideas back to you. But the first um, slide when I'm trying to explain the international context, shows you a comparison of select countries uh, per capita greenhouse gases on a consumption basis. So as nations move forward and get serious about mitigating climate change, our national liability isn't just the greenhouse gases within our boundaries, it's the greenhouse gases associated with our global supply chain. So the numbers you see in this first table rank nations, uh, not all nations, but a number of nations um, based on the global greenhouse gas footprint of, of our uh, consumption. This is, a, this, is, this is not a complete analysis. Uh, the numbers will change a bit, but the rankings won't. And what you'll find is the biggest footprints in the world um, are the OPEC nations, some of which are not on this slide. They are higher than the top number that I put in the table, um, Australia, the United States, and Canada. So the bottom line is when everybody gets serious, there is going to be a significant global expectation that Canada pulls significant weight because we're really high 
on that global ranking of per capita consumption-based greenhouse gas emissions. So next slide, please. This is a table that, uh, again, don't worry about trying to read the numbers there, but I wanted to also point out where we sit in as British Columbia in a Canadian context. So I'm saying Canada is going to have a big obligation. Uh, whether people perceive we do now, we will. Um, within Canada, interestingly enough, um, if you uh, the, the 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 performance goals that people talk about in the international community are goals to reduce emissions to some percent below 2005 levels by 2030, 2040, and 2050 with the idea we get to something like they call net zero by 2050. Um, the, the, our, our federal government has, has formally made a commitment that Canadians will reduce our emissions to 40% below 2005 levels uh, uh, by 2030, so 100 months from now. And if we look at where different provinces sit right now, um, uh, in terms of tracking our performance in just plain reduction terms, and, I, and in this table I show three different metrics, absolute greenhouse gas emissions relative to 2005 levels per capita and, um, and on a per dollar real GDP basis. In fact, of the 10 provinces, BC ranks, depending on which metric you choose, number three, four, or number six. We ain't the Canadian leader. We got a ways to go. So what does that mean? It means we've got a significant challenge. If British Columbia was to have to reduce our emissions absolutely to 40% below 2005 levels over the next 100 months, that means we have to reduce all um, emissions associated with operating all forms of buildings, all of British Columbia industry, and all of our transport by 50% in 100 months. If we are expecting to reach our objectives without, inclu without including land use change, the opportunity to se sequester carbon and natural systems. I would argue, please stare at the numbers, debate me if I think I'm wrong. There is no possible way for BC to get anywhere near our fair share of our international or, or, or domestic objectives if we don't mobilize all of the opportunities to sequester carbon in our natural systems. We have a huge opportunity for many reasons that people have expressed before to be a world leader in the technologies, both the monitoring, measurement, estimation, uh, information, data, and new practice uh, technologies uh, for a bunch of different reasons. But you know what? As important as the opportunity to generate and, and build a new green economy and jobs um, out of our um, capacity to store carbon, in the natural systems. There's also the other side. If we don't figure out how to do it, we're in deep, deep, deep. I'm not allowed to say the S word, probably not, but you get it. When you stare, as I hope you do, at the tables with the data that are too small, which is too small to see, the one we're looking at right now, I want you to look near the bottom. I've highlighted a line, and there's this wonderful line that says emissions from decomposition of harvested wood products in 2005, 43.6 million tons. In 2019, 41.4 million tons. I do hope that there's some opportunity for the members of the RAND network to get together and stare at those numbers and say, is that a liability or the single largest opportunity that anybody in Canada has to do something really, really neat? I think it's the latter. I'd love to find myself in a room with a bunch of experts to debate that. I think, you know, I, first of all, I must really, really be clear here. I, 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 I always have strong opinions about what the next amazing new net technology is. And so far, my track record suggests I'm always wrong. But um, this looks to me like the 
only place in the world we should be commercializing the um, the um, mobile pyrolysis unit that's going to be converting uh, fine fuel into highly recalcitrant carbon and to soak it into with uh, with uh, in, in, into um, treated municipal waste to make a world leading compost application that really does lead to significant retention of carbon and soils. It sounds kind of looks like nobody in the world is in a position to start pursuing thoughts like I'm hoping one day soon we get back from the big picture. Oh, there it is, to staring at our inventory and seeing where the opportunities are, because I think they're huge. Can we go to the next slide, please? And that's not the only one. I'm just saying when you stare at the inventory, you're all going to see stuff. I'd sure love to start going to meetings where we're all, there it is, that yellow line. That yellow line, that's, that's a big existing emission liability that I think is a huge, huge opportunity for um, world leading change and job creation and um, a great BC story. Next slide. Um, I've got to stop, but I want to say, would we get down to that as I, I love the RAND network, there's a few things that I really hope we wanted we can do together. One is, can we be the first jurisdiction in the world, not just Canada, to start with, uh, uh, I love Lisa uh, Zabek's maps and her presentation yesterday. Can we build together a digital map where everybody in the province, not just farmers, can easily go to the map and see what the opportunities are to reduce emissions and what the sources of emissions are in, in their neighborhood. And uh, I, I, uh, Terramara is working on some of the elements of that which really fit Terramara's business case. But if we were collaborating with other stakeholders who would like to see other information in that same map for other reasons, we could build the interactive map in, in, in British Columbia that not only gives everybody in the, the, the information they need to start imagining what they can do in a new proactive way. But you know what? Um, it, uh, it also should make us a magnet for innovation. I mean, if we get that digital map up and in place and it's interactive and it's the best in the world, then anytime anybody says, I've got this new tech, I'm better at estimating soil carbon stocks than anybody else. It should be automatic for the uh, listener to respond by saying, well, which of the experimental demonstration sites in British Columbia are you going to take that technology to, to calibrate, uh, commercialize, and, 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 uh, and, 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 uh, and uh, demonstrate it? And uh, I think if we stare at our inventory till opportunities jump at us and we get focused pretty quickly on building that publicly accessible uh, digital map, um, we won't look back. So maybe I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Alden, for that. That was very interesting. I, I hadn't um, heard about the idea before about the digital map, and I, I'm looking forward to maybe talking about that more with the other panelists. So thank you very much. Um, so moving on, uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Ranveer Chandra. Um, is the Managing Director for Research for Industry at the CTO of AgriFood at Microsoft. Dr. Thank you, Michelle. Hi. So Dr. Chandra has published over 90 research papers, uh, um, filed over 150 patents, and received numerous awards, including MIT Technology Review's Top Innovator Under 35. So welcome, Dr. Chandra. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I really liked what Alden mentioned, especially the last point around that interactive map. I think that will be such an awesome tool if someone could build it. So today I'll talk a little bit about um, agriculture and food and the work we are doing in that space. Before I start, I did want to mention that I'm not, my background is not in agriculture. I'm a PhD in computer science. But that said, I have been working in this space for the last uh, seven years where I started the Palm Beats project at Microsoft. I, uh, we took it to product, we've done, we, it got a, Bill Gates featured it on Gates Notes. I also serve on the um, advisory board, the scientific advisory board for Terramera, and I'm working closely in this space. So today what I'll talk about is how do we view 
agriculture and its impact on uh, on climate change, primarily broadly sustainability, but also climate change and how technology can play a role. And also briefly mention what is Microsoft doing in this space? So as many of you know, and it was covered over the last two days that agriculture has a sustainability problem. It is one of the biggest sources of emissions across different forms of agriculture. And here I'm taking a worldwide view. In addition to that, uh, climate change impacts farmers the most. They are the ones who have been doing the same thing in the farm for several years, maybe decades, if not generations, and they are the most affected if, the, if there is climate change. But interestingly, agriculture could also be a solution. That is, agriculture can help put carbon back into soil and help be a solution by reducing the, uh, reducing the amount of greenhouses, greenhouse gases. So this has been the case, and you know, there are several companies that are working on ways in which to, they could use technology to help with all three. That is, how do you account for emissions? If you put sensors in different places, you look at satellite data, you'll be able to estimate how much emissions are happening. You could also start looking at weather predictions to start helping a farmer know how the climate's changing. And you could also try to estimate how much uh, carbon is sequestered in soil if you could start putting lots and lots of sensors or capturing uh, or just doing large amount of samples. However, that is not good enough. And I'll talk about two key challenges with existing digital solutions. And if we are serious about building such a tool for agriculture, we need to unblock two significant technology barriers. The number one, which we saw in the keynote today as well, is around connectivity. That is that most of these farms do not have good internet access. We heard from Jeff, Jeff was not talking from the middle of a farm, he was in his house where there is some internet connectivity. If you go out in the farm, there is hardly any internet connectivity out there. Even in the US, there was a recent USDA study that said over 70% of the farmland doesn't have good internet access. And if you're talking of connecting sensors, connecting phones, connecting drones, connecting tractors, well, there is no internet connectivity. The, towards that at Microsoft, one of the technologies that we've been working on, and I personally have been doing this since 2005, is a technology called TV white spaces. What this enables is imagine if you have a Wi-Fi router that can go several miles. And the, then the way we did this was we took Wi-Fi signals and we put them in empty TV channels. This is TV you watch using antennas. When you browse through TV on certain channels, you get a transmission. The other channels, all you see is white noise. And the reason this is so cool is that compared to Wi-Fi in TV channels, in UHF TV channels, your signals go four times farther. In VHF, they go 12 times farther. And the interesting thing about agriculture is that TV towers are in cities. You have TV towers in Vancouver. The farms are typically away from the cities. If you turn on a, a TV in the middle of a farm, most of the channels are empty. They're just white noise. That's nothing coming there. And the more noisy channels there are, the more capacity there is. You're talking of hundreds of megabits per second of available capacity in the middle of a farm if you could start using the spectrum for connectivity. So this is one of the things we're doing. In addition to that, we are working on technologies such as private 5G. Uh, one of the things we just showcased with the, with the 5G Open Innovation Lab was a farm where we used an edge and a 5G connectivity. It's more expensive than TV spectrum, but it's something which if you have a 5G phone, you can then start getting connected in the middle of a farm. We're also working on space connectivity, but that is one barrier we really need to unlock if we need to start, if we want to start building tools for digital agriculture, for regenerative agriculture. The second challenge is that of the number of sensors that are needed. If you want to build an accurate map of a farm, and this is one of the fundamental problems that we face in for soil carbon, that is how do you estimate the amount of carbon that is sequestered in soil? If you want to build an accurate map, you would need lots of samples, lots of sensors, which quickly becomes very expensive. TerraMare is doing some very interesting work in this space. In addition to that, what you actually need is to, a way to use very few samples and inexpensive ways to start estimating the amount of carbon in soil. A farmer anywhere in the world should be able to, at very low cost, verifiably correctly say this is the amount of carbon that was sequestered in soil. Right now, existing methods are quite expensive to build these maps. One of the ways we are, we are reducing the cost is by using artificial intelligence. 
The way we are doing that is a technology which we're building called multimodal sensing. We are taking data, this we did for the previous work on Farm Beats as well, where we took data from sensors, we combined that with data from satellites, from drones, and you combine all of these to build much more accurate maps for farms. And the other thing we are doing with AI is around uh, using simulations. So this is where there, there's been some really good work around uh, using physics or biological models to estimate how much carbon there is in soil, using AI to make these models much run much, uh, much more accurate. These are ways in which you can reduce the cost for going and accurately estimating the amount of carbon that is sequestered in soil in any farmland. Towards that, uh, at Microsoft, we actually, we've, we've, we've announced a product called Azure Farm Beats. Uh, this is in public preview. We announced partnerships with Land Lakes. We are working with Terramero on this as well. On this is a platform. At Microsoft, we are not building a tool for the farmers. What we are doing is we're building a platform for other ag tech companies to build their solutions on top of the platform that we are building using cloud, using artificial intelligence. We are bringing all of these capabilities, these, these digital tools, so that any ag tech company can then start building their solutions on top, making use of all the technologies I was talking about before. So as part of Microsoft Farm Beats, we've released that, we are working with several companies. On top of that, we are also building like a carbon pipeline, where either if you're getting samples or you're getting simulations, you should be able to specify any polygon, a polygon could be a farm, it could be a field, it could be multiple plots. We'll, give, we'll try to give an estimate of how much carbon is sequestered in soil. Again, that tool is not for growers. This is a tool for other ag tech companies to build their solutions on top, uh, on top of the cloud. The other thing I wanted to uh, mention as well, Microsoft last year, we made a big commitment around carbon. Microsoft announced that by 2030, we are going to be carbon negative. That is, we're going to put back more carbon than the amount of carbon we generate. And by 2050, we are going to remove all the emissions that Microsoft's ever generated since the time Microsoft was founded. Now, these are very ambitious goals and how are we going to get there? Part of how we are going to get there is by reducing our own emissions. And uh, we, have, uh, we have very ambitious goals um, to get there as well. That is, we're going to reduce our GHG emissions by half or more. But that's, and these are things where, you know, we have 100% uh, of our electricity will be ma matched by zero carbon energy purchases. We'll electrify a vehicle fleet. We'll stop using diesel for backup energy and a lot of these. In addition to that, we'll also have to invest in new ways to get carbon, to, to remove carbon from the atmosphere. Towards that, um, last year, we made the biggest ever corporate purchase of, uh, of carbon. We purchased 1.3 million tons um, of carbon removal from the atmosphere. And this included projects to remove forests, uh, to, to expand forests in Peru, in Nicaragua, in the United States. We also uh, worked with Climeworks, which is like one of those really funky companies. They're, they're really thinking out of the box of a machine to pull CO2 from the air. In addition to that, we also uh, purchased uh, soil carbon uh, re to regenerate soil across U.S. farms. We purchase carbon credits from, from land or lakes. So those are things that we are doing. We are working with partners. We are investing in, we are investing in technology. We are taking this technology to partners. And um, I wanted to conclude by, okay, what is it that we're doing in the future? What is it that you can expect Microsoft to be doing? What are some of those big bets technology-wise that we are doing around carbon? One of the things our vision is that, you know, we want to enable farmers everywhere to estimate the amount of carbon that is there in soil. We want to truly democratize soil sensing. And how do you get there? One of the ways, you know, right now, these sensors that you purchase, they are a few hundred, if not a thousand dollars, and not to measure CO2 and all, that's much more expensive if you buy one of those methane sensors or NO2 sensors. And just talking of soil moisture, soil EC sensing, that's quite expensive. One of the technologies we are looking at is, can you use uh, Wi-Fi in your phone to start estimating soil, uh, soil moisture and soil EC. The way we are doing that is, uh, the reason for this is because these, these sensors are expensive, most of these farmers and smallholder farmers, they can't afford sensors at a few hundred dollars or a thousand dollars, but many of them have a smartphone, even if it is an inexpensive smartphone. If they have a smartphone, it has a Wi-Fi chipset in it. If it has a Wi-Fi chipset in it, one of the key ideas we had was, you could use the time of flight of a Wi-Fi signal to estimate soil moisture and soil EC. 
And the time of flight, just based on physics, depends on the permittivity of the material. So if your soil is moist, it's going to take longer to traverse the same distance. And then we wrote a paper on it. We, uh, that's, there's more details to it. But the vision of this is eventually we want anyone to take their phone close to soil and start measuring soil moisture, soil EC, and potentially soil carbon. Uh, I will, so Bill Gates blogged about this on Gates Notes, and the title of his blog was Can the Wi-Fi in Your Phone Help Feed the World? I was giving this talk last year, just before COVID hit us at the National Academies, and Professor Lal, who won the World Food Prize last year, he was in the audience. And he was like, hey, if you could do this for soil moisture, I can, do, I can start looking at ways to estimate soil carbon. So this is one of the things we are working on with Professor Lal. The other thing we are working on is a what-if analysis tool. That is, can you give empower a, a farmer to do what-if analysis, to say, if I did this particular action in the farm, how is it going to affect productivity, but also different sustainability metrics around carbon sequestration, water use, and how will it impact productivity, and eventually tying it to price. So those are some of the things we are currently working on. I'm really excited to be part of this panel. I really like being involved with uh, Terra Mera and uh, uh, we're planning to start some work with UBC. I was planning a trip up there before just when COVID hit, but hopefully we'll get started with, uh, with work there. I'm coming at it from a technology viewpoint. I did grow up in a farm. I spent a lot of time growing up in a farm and I would love to partner with people in the audience and, and my panelists as well to help make a change. This is such an important problem. And I think we all can come together, like the tool that uh, Alden was mentioning, all the science that Sean has done with the technologies that we are building to really make, uh, make a difference. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ranveer. That was uh, fascinating. The level of technology and the development that's going on looking into not just, you know, we all sometimes forget sometimes how important that measurement component is. To how do you measure? How do you know if you're being successful? So thank you very much. Looking forward to hearing more from you as well. Um, okay, our final panelist uh, for this session tonight is uh, Dr. Sean Smuckler. Uh, Sean is the Chair of Agriculture and Environment, uh, Associate Professor and Associate Dean of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies for the Faculty of Land and Food Systems at the University of British Columbia. He leads the Sustainable Agricultural Landscapes Laboratory, which currently focuses on researching ways to help farmers adapt to climate change and improve the sustainability of their farming practices, specifically as they re relate to soils. So welcome, Dr. Smuckler. Great, Thank, thanks for having me. It's really exciting to, to be here and be part of the, the RAND network. Um, so I'm actually going to talk uh, about where we just left off in, uh, in terms of quantifying changes in, in soil organic carbon, but also the associated benefits. And I'm going to give some examples from the work that we're doing uh, from the farm field all the way up to the agricultural landscape. Regenerative agriculture, as we've been talking about, is really about building a healthier soil we are trying to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere to build soil organic carbon, soil organic matter. And in doing so, building soil that has greater water holding capacity, increased infiltration, uh, increased uh, nutrient storage and cycling, improved tilth, disease resilience, but also, and really importantly, reduces the amount of nitrous oxide and methane emissions, which are very powerful greenhouse gases, and at the same time reduces the amount of losses of nitrogen and phosphorus to uh, the neighboring waterways. So quantifying changes is what we do in my lab. Uh, what we're trying to, to, to do is to, to get better at this. We are, would argue that accurate quantification of changes in soil or organic carbon and these associated benefits really helps farmers to understand what management practices are working well, given their specific crop soil climate, gives policymakers uh, the tools they need to develop strategies to incentivize the adoption of the management practices that are working. And then it facilitates the possibility of an effective soil organic carbon market and meaningful greenhouse gas reduction. But there are some 
key challenges yet to quantification. And Rainvere brought up some really innovative uh, ways to improve quantification. Some of the challenges we face are soil organic carbon changes slowly in our soils. So measuring it annually is really challenging to do. Uh, we may see uh, measurable changes given the technologies that we have only after four to five years in some cases. Management impacts can also be really variable. It depends on the approach of the, the farmer, the specific soils they're, they're farming on, the climate that they're farming in. Uh, not all soil organic carbon is the same. So we are realizing now that you can't just measure the total stock and assume that that all is going to be locked away for uh, the duration of this climate crisis that some carbon is more recalcitrant, more valuable for mitigation than others. And these associated benefits that can be equally, if not more important to the farmer themselves are even harder to measure than soil organic carbon. So our research objective, one of our primary research objectives is to develop accurate cost-effective quantification of regenerative practices. And we're doing this in terms of field sampling, as was mentioned before, it's really expensive, uh, soil analysis, and working on some of those uh, innovative techniques that Renvir mentioned, spatial and temporal modeling. So field sampling is still the, the workhorse of quantification. Uh, it's it's the, the, the tried and true method, but it is, expensive and time consuming to do it at meaningful scales. Uh, while we have some really innovative uh, techniques out there, it still comes back to some basic soil sampling techniques of uh, just digging a hole, quantifying uh, the concentration of soil organic carbon, but then converting it to stocks through uh, a measurement of bulk density, density, which is generally quite simple, but hard to do well. And we're comparing those two methodologies for quantifying differences with uh, a newer method, a mass-based method that uh, accounts for changes in the density of soil over time. And uh, just to give you an example of how these Three methods of quantification, although all very simple, produce very different results. A, a master student of mine, Lindsay Dowell, recently uh, did a study looking at uh, hedgerow and riparian buffer soil organic carbon and illustrated that these three methods, uh, when we looked at the changes over time from hedgerows, uh, were very different depending on which method of soil analysis of, of quantification in the field you use, concentrations, depth base, and mass base, in some cases showing opposite trends. We're also working at the, uh, the field scale trying to identify, as Renvir alluded to, the, the sweet spot in terms of the amount of sampling to do to generate uh, uh, continuous digital maps of, of fields in terms of soil organic carbon. We've worked with uh, aerial imagery taken from drones and intensely sampled fields. And we've been using uh, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. This is the workhorse of our laboratory. Uh, a, a, a relatively uh, proven technology to, to use spectral inference to predict soil organic carbon. And we've identified the sweet spot for our soils down in Delta. We've identified that if we're mapping a field, we probably need two to three samples uh, per hectare in order to achieve the same amount of resolution, accuracy, and precision that is required when we uh, sample even at higher densities. But we know that uh, this could be increased dramatically with innovative technologies that would put this workhorse of mine, this really expensive benchtop spectrometer on the back of a tractor or out in the field in someone's hand. That would be a game changer. And it seems like we're getting close to that. 
But we also have to recognize that we, we need to measure the net field emissions. So it's not just about carbon, it's about methane and nitrous oxide and the overall net uh, global climate impact. So we're also using uh, field instruments to ensure that we're capturing that, that full uh, accounting. And we're actually showing that some of our more uh, carbon intensive practices, the typical farming, organic farming uh, practices that put on large quantities of compost and are building soil carbon are also emitting far more nitrous oxide than uh, the alternatives. So there's a clear trade-off between the amount of carbon being stored and the amount of nitrous oxide that's being produced. When uh, we think about trying to scale up our estimates to a, a meaningful regional or provincial level, it's really about spatial and temporal modeling based on integrating satellite remote sensing uh, data, remotely sensed data and uh, field sampling. So we have done regional analysis, um, PhD student of mine, Siddhartha Paul, uh, did an analysis of clay and soil organic carbon and used some uh, pedo transfer functions, a, a number of different equations to actually predict not just the soil organic carbon that's stored in those landscapes, but also the, uh, the workability of those soils. So there's one of these additional benefits that's really important to soils in our, for farmers in our region. He also did a uh, uh, an exercise, uh, an, an evaluation, the first in the province of changes in soil organic carbon from 1984 through 2018 using historic satellite imagery. And not only did he develop a baseline for 2018 that we can work forward from, but he came up with an estimate for what we've lost over the last 30 or so years. And uh, importantly, we've lost uh, carbon, soil organic carbon on 61% of one of our most agriculturally intensive and productive regions in the province, the, the lower Fraser Valley. So uh, to just point out some, some conclusions here, we are making significant progress towards our objective of accurate cost-effective quantification, but we still have a ways to go. It really feels like an exciting time. It feels like this momentum has built and companies like Microsoft and Terramera are uh, moving the science much faster than we have in decades. And it's clear that there are some synergies and some trade-offs and it's, it's imperative that we don't just solely focus on, on carbon and, and think that that's doing what we want in terms of the climate mitigation component. And then it's important to recognize that there are some, some major hurdles yet. There's some basic field sampling and analysis hurdles that we're, we're trying to tackle. We still have uh, a fair amount of work to really integrate effectively the remote sensing and field field based data, and there are certainly limited uh, data sets across the diversity of soils and climates that we see in in BC, let alone Canada. And then there, the elephant in the room is you know a lot a lot of what we know is about soil organic carbon in our current climate. And we don't really know what's going to happen when our climate starts shifting. So, uh, yeah, if, you, if you're interested in any of the, the examples that I provided here, uh, please uh, visit um, the Sustainable Agricultural Labs website. And I'm uh, happy to take some questions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Smuckler. And thank you to the other panelists. So I've been listening intently and thinking about uh, everything you've been talking about. And I'm going to put out a really difficult question. I'll probably start with you, Alden. <laughs> Maybe circle back to uh, Sean and give uh, Ranveer a break on this one, just because he's not from BC, although he might have something to say. But OK, so given the technological and methodological challenges that you've talked about with measuring carbon, 
Add the great diversity of the BC landscape and our agricultural practices. I need, I want to put it out to you, what, what are realistic goals for carbon sequestration in BC, in the BC ag sector? So I'd, I'd, I'd open, start with you if it's okay, Alden. Okay, and um, again, I'm, I'm always very uh, confident and proved wrong. So, you know, with that caveat, if, if we're just looking at, um, say, comprehensively transitioning from extractive to regenerative on cropped land and grazing land in British Columbia, um, uh, but maintaining all of the productive land in production, it's a, it's a small number. I, I put it at about 3 million tons a year. But if we're talking about integrating that uh, efficient uh, removal of um, fine, fine, uh, fine fuel, um, decomposing biomass from the land and, and converting it into recalcitrant carbon, which the, 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 the um, disposition of which on the land tends to make the land more productive. There's another 48 million tons a year there. So, so again, we're, we're unique. I can't say that about any other jurisdiction I've ever, ever looked at. We should be very, very clear that we're in a unique and special position. We should figure out what we want to do about it. Thanks. John? Yeah, I, I don't have a, a, a number uh, in terms of tons to, to throw out there, but what I would say is that uh, we really need all sectors to, to be contributing to emission reductions. Uh, we do know that the agricultural sector is likely to increase emissions without, uh, without some direction, without some incentive to do otherwise. So I... We, we know that the, the management practices are out there to, to put, put carbon back in the ground. We know that there are these associated benefits. Uh, the exact number might change as we mobilize widely and get a better grip on uh, what, what the, 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 the rate is that we're gonna be sequestering. But it, it's this chicken or the egg thing. We, we need the data. We, we, we need farmers across the province to start doing these practices to really uh, do this experiment on a scale that, that, that is meaningful. And then we need to go out and, and, and take the measurements. So I think, it, it, I, I don't think we should worry about the actual total number at this point. We should just get going and do it. And I'll just add to what Sean and Alden said, it's more, um, you know, one of the things I was reading, now, of course, I'm not from BC, but I did try to catch up and read a little bit about <laughs> BC. One of the interesting statistics I saw was that, uh, that, one, there is an increasing age of the average farmer in BC, which is consistent with the rest of the world, which means that we need to make technology more usable for them. But the other interesting statistic was there was also an increase in the number of farmers who were below 35 years old. The segment that went down was 35 to 55, but below, th so there are much, many more younger farmers in BC, and that might be an opportunity to, to leverage that, to leverage the younger population. They're tech savvy. The younger population also thinks a lot about the environment to, to leverage that, to actually drive some of these regenerative agriculture pra practices in BC. Thank you. No, I know that's certainly, uh, I think a, an important component of the RAN network is, is, is looking at that younger generation and trying to target it. So maybe I'll continue on with you, uh, RAN Veer. So maybe just if you could expand a little bit more, you're on the theme of younger farmers, but what about small scale farmers? That's such a yeah. you know, significant part of BC's ag sector. So how can small scale farmers um, sequester carbon? Yeah, no, this is, uh, this is a very interesting question, Michelle. This is something that uh, I'm extremely passionate about. As I mentioned a little bit, that growing up, I spent a lot of time in India and a lot of every year, a few months, I would spend my grandparents' farm in North Bihar, which was a, Bihar is one of the poorest states in India. And back then, I didn't like anything to do with agriculture because 
these villages, they did not have any electricity, no toilets. It was not the most fun part of the year, but I did learn a lot. And that's been driving a lot of my work. And through all of this, I keep thinking about, okay, how do you make smallholder farmers more productive, more profitable, more be able to practice more sustainable agriculture practices? Because, you know, the smallholder farmers are the ones who are doing the least to impact climate, but they are the ones who are affected the most. They are not as tech savvy. They are not the ones who have as many resources and they will be the ones who will be least prepared with any change to, to, to handle the change because of climate. So for them, uh, we need to democratize tools. We also need the government to, we need appropriate policies in place as well for smallholder farmers to be made, uh, to be able to use technology, because I think that's the number one barrier to get them connectivity, to get them technology, to subsidize, just like we subsidize irrigation systems, we subsidize equipment, we should be subsidizing uh, data-driven agriculture with digital agriculture tools around regenerative farming. Because even when we talk of a lot of remote sensing tools and such, they don't really work as well for a smallholder farmer because these farms are much smaller. The pixel size, a few pixels cover an entire farm. On the other hand, we need new sorts of tools. We need them to start putting sensors in the ground. We need them to start maybe enabling new business models where you start aggregating, like you have a drone service provider covering multiple farms instead of having every farm have their own drone in the form of climate drone. So you need new technology, new business models, as well as new policies if we need to get the smallholder farmers to start using any of these regenerative agricultural practices. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess one thing I'm thinking about too is, you know, that we're, we're here, we're talking about agriculture. Whenever I think of, you know, carbon sequestration, of course you would think soil, soil-based agriculture. Just this is maybe a little bit out there for you, but what about your thoughts on like vertical farming? Does that help or make things worse? I'm not sure, like, is there, um, in terms of, you know, if you're giving up that opportunity to sequester carbon, but is there what you, what thoughts from the panel on this? Alden? I, I, I'm really not biochar obsessed, but if you look at certain uh, crops and vertical farming, hemp comes to mind. Um, when you look at the residual that's left from the vertical farms, if you're converting that to biochar and it's going back on the land, you can, there's a really, really great potential feedback loop there. So when it comes to vertical farming, I think it's um, something we should really, really, really keep on the agenda um, um, for a lot of reasons. I'll just, I, I, I'm an old lady, you know, 25 years ago, I was in a hotel room in Sydney, Australia, where all of the gray water and waste, waste heat from the hotel went up to the greenhouse that was the top two floors of the hotel that grew all the cucumbers and tomatoes that were consumed in the restaurant in the hotel. Like that's not new technology. Why aren't we automatically going there? And then when we think about vertical farms, again, they still create um, residue and waste. How are we managing all of the food waste and the production uh, and the, and the uh, bio, biomass residue from the farms, whether it's on the land or in the city on top of a hotel to create re recalcitrant seed that we're recycling back either into um, you know, solid carbon products or back um, onto the land. I, I, we can do this. Others? Um, okay, maybe one last question before um, we maybe have to wind it down. I haven't got the, the hook yet, but I think it's coming. Um, just last question probably to, to you, Sean and Ranbir is, um, so what does the future of farming look like to you? Sean, you wanna go first? Sure. I mean, I, 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 I see the, the future of farming being uh, exciting for young people. I ask my class every year, uh, how many of you actually want to be farmers? This is a second year uh, class at UBC. And over the 10 years that I've been teaching there, I've been really excited to see more and more hands being raised every year. And I think a lot of it is because companies like Microsoft are uh, they're 
making it something that is exciting um, through, through technology. This combination of technology and agroecology, we're seeing this a, a synergy and in, in, in excitement in our, in our students. And so a future, the future looks like one that all the students raise their hand. Awesome. No, thank you, Sean, for the shout out. And from uh, my perspective, I think more uh, technology will permeate uh, agriculture. That is, farmers will, everything will become more digitized. I'm not saying that farmers will be replaced. I think farmers, their knowledge will be augmented with data and AI. So I don't expect any like computers to learn what a farmer knows, but a, a, every farmer will get more data and then use AI to make their operations better. That's one. The other thing I think that there will be a close, the, the loop between the consumer and the farmer will close. A consumer like us, we'll be able to know where something came from, how it was grown. So farmers would be incentivized to grow things in a particular way where the consumer is satisfied that they are eating nutritious food and they are also helping the planet in a good way. So I think the future farmer is not only going to be growing food, they are also going to be custodians of the land, custodians of the planet. Well, thank you very much. Um, there's so much uh, more to talk about here. The, the whole digital gap with farming is fascinating to me as well. The role of private sector, Microsoft, Terramara, we've got TELUS in BC, that's our guest across Canada. There's so much here. So um, thank you all very, very much um, for your time. I think that this brings the end of our panel to the sort of panel's ending now. So I think we're going to go back into the main room, but thank you all. Do you have any final words anyone want to say before we sign off? Okay. Kent, thank you so much. See you back on the, on the flip side in the big room. Thank you, Michelle. Okay. Thank you.